Um, Ireland is fairly unique and it's one of the few places in the world that we still race on public roads. We have very few custom built race tracks, so most weekends public roads are closed and we go and race motorbikes on them. So, how soon after your motorcycle crash, if you're crazy enough to race in the streets, do you want your medical care to start? Who should start that medical care? What sort of medical care should you receive and when? And who owns that medical care? Which ologist, which specialist? should be providing that sort of medical care. I'm Jason van der Velde. I'm a pre-hospital emergency medicine critical care retrieval physician, and I'm based in West Cork in Ireland. And um, my passion is providing good quality care where the patient needs it. I grew up in South Africa, hence the accent, and... Um, this was me at school. I was never really made to feel like the tribe. You'll notice I have no words in my slides because I still don't read very well. And I was never part of the tribe. I suppose uh, words like dyslexia didn't exist back then. Words like neurodivergent didn't exist back then. And so I left school quite early and I joined the Ablin service. And um, it really, truly was the wiki, wild west of uh, care delivery. We would literally fill up those ambulances with as many patients as we could possibly find <laughs> and just, you know, hope that they would make hospital alive. And I was always driven to do more because I knew I, I, I could do more for these patients. I got injured at work, I got quite badly injured, and that was actually a blessing because it forced me to go back to education. Um, I just learned how to... <laughs> I didn't learn how to cheat, but I learned how to actually make exam answers, you know, the way that the marking schedules were made. And um, I ended up joining another tribe, which was a lot of rugby. Uh, but I got into medical school, and I don't know how I did it, but I actually passed. You know, you know what they call the person who 
got the lowest mark in medical school. Doctor, you've got it. So it, it does work. The scene here with my best mate, Fraser, who, um, yeah, he's decidedly better than me. I was always into resuscitation, so at that time I joined the anesthetic tribe. Yeah, I, I soon realized that, that um, they weren't my people. Um, you know, where I was working at the time in England, it was very much uh, just purely operating room anesthesia and... I got very bored very quickly of Sudoku. Um, I also couldn't pass anesthetic exams because they were just completely beyond my, you know, my, my reading level. And so I joined and uh, started with Dr. Mark Forrest the um, Anesthesia Tra Trauma Critical Care course, which after 25 years is the, probably the cutting edge um, trauma care course you know, worldwide. What we did is effectively we took medical education and broke it down into understandable simulation. And we don't teach by words. We don't teach by books. We teach by doing. And I suppose that was the, very, the difference. Lots of very passionate people. Um, we even went as far as to join the Royal College of Surgeons. <laughs> yeah. That's another, another story. Um, but actually to produce a fellowship. And so my fellowship is actually with the Royal College of Surgeons, although I'm not a surgeon. Um, I went and moved to Ireland. That was a long story, but um, the critical care side of anesthetics was available there, and I really enjoyed doing the patient transfer stuff. But things weren't quite right. Um, I was really badly bullied by a very senior member of the anesthetic community in Cork, and it was largely over, largely over private stuff, but also because I couldn't finish my exams, so they were getting more and more frustrated with me, and um, that bullying was relentless. It was the sort of person who taught by humiliation. Do you know the type? I, I just couldn't tolerate it, really. Um, I couldn't tolerate being talked down to just because I couldn't, you know, digest 75 pages of a manual. And I said goodbye to anesthetics, and I joined another tribe. You lot. <laughs> Who are? You know. And I think over the next three days, we're going to be really in enjoying some quality time together as a tribe, celebrating all that is good and all that is wonderful about the specialty of emergency medicine. We're going to be looking at for example, and try and examine what defines us as emergency medicine physicians. We're going to be looking at procedures, the governance and the background to these procedures and how they should be carried out. Procedures like suprapubic catheters, for example, chest strains, thoracotomies even. Who should own these procedures? Should it be us? What happens when we do such procedures? You see, I'm 20 years on, and so is Fraser. And he's the clinical director now in Glasgow of emergency medicine. And I haven't done too badly for myself as somebody who uh, was told they were absolutely worthless at school. Um, I'm now the national clinical lead for emergency telemedicine in Ireland. And um, for my sins, and I, I do say for my sins, I sit on the regulator, and the regulator is the Pre-Hospital Emergency Care Council. It's the paramedicine regulator in Ireland, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on this morning, about pre-hospital care in Ireland. Um, but as somebody who sits on the regulator, I get to see where medicine goes wrong. And I get to see where people come before fitness to practice, for example. and where, 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 where clinicians are in trouble. And we get to support them through that process or else decide that we need to take their careers away from them. And that's quite humbling. And actually, as part of that process, I've got to learn just how pervasive and how damaging 
incivility or rudeness is to patients and to practitioners. John Hines opened that presentation with a video from Smack, and um, John gave a very good uh, he gave a very good kind of presentation about how he did a thoracotomy on that patient that you saw there at the end of that video. And John would follow the motorbikes around the track, as you saw. He would go around on the first lap at very high speeds so that he could provide good quality resuscitative care where the patient needed it at the point of injury. That rider fulfilled all of the Resuscitation Council guidelines for a resuscitative thoracotomy. And he got one. And he got one from an extremely competent, well-drilled team. But John's lecture wasn't about the halo or the high acuity, low opportunity procedure. John's lecture was about the crucifixion, or to put it another way, the very extreme, very public criticism of his medical practice from in hospitalologists that followed. Tribal incivility comes in many shapes and forms. I, I love scrubs, by the way. <laughs> and it's a very unexpected topic for a medical conference, isn't it? And, but it's the topic that you should be extremely cognitive of and aware of, and particularly given the transformation that I, I understand from my chats last night that, that Sweden is, is undergoing in, in emergency medicine. And John experienced and reflected on three types of personality traits that he encountered whenever he did a HALO procedure. And the first one of those traits was the psychophants. So psychophant is a difficult word for me. Um, I definitely can't spell it. Um, but uh, you can laugh at that. Um, it basically is hero worshippers, okay? And you will encounter these if you do one of those procedures because you know, these are guys who think you're really cool for cracking the chest or for doing that lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. And, you know, especially in emergency medicine, th those people who wanted to be John, those people who wanted to crack the chest at the side of the road and be that first one to do that awesome procedure in the new department with a new kit. And John made a compelling argument that whilst those people make you feel good, they are probably one of the most dangerous attitudes in healthcare. Because they will just do the procedure for their logbook, because it makes them look cool, because they just want to do it, not necessarily because the patient needs it. And so a lot of assumptions start happening when a resuscitative thoracotomy gets done down in the ED from the ologists in the ivory tower. And so we have to be very careful of the image that we, we put out. Then there are the skeptics. And skeptics are your allies, they are your friends. They are the awkward ones who have awkward conversations with you, but they do so through wonderment, through wondering whether this is appropriate, Yes, they're frustrating, they're the late adapters. We're all early adapters in emergency medicine by virtue of what we do. But they can be brought around to your decision making provided your evidence for what you do is appropriate. And that's very important. They are your greatest allies. Yes, they're painful, but they're your greatest allies. And then they're the hashtag resus wankers. And I'm sure that word translates relatively easily. Those who openly and viciously attack practice, they demanded that John be suspended and investigated and some sort of justice be, be, be sought. You know, John argued that the hardest part of doing a resuscitative thoracotomy wasn't the actual HALO procedure itself, making that first incision. It was dealing with the aftermath, dealing 
with those hashtag recess wankers. And John concluded after much reflection, because he was a very you know, he's a strong, strong character, never allow a wanker to let you down. And they're good words. But I want to ensure that nothing gets lost in translation here. And that's very important because the evidence is that most of you have experienced a hashtag recess wanker at work. And those who think you haven't, you just haven't realized it. And that's what this talk's about. The root causes of incivility. The root causes of rudeness. Incivility thrives in hierarchical organizations. It's a top-down effect. It's been around since the time of Hippocrates. It has become culturally normal in medicine, in healthcare. High levels of pressure and stress contribute to a sense of seniority. And when seniority makes frank, sometimes undiplomatic conversations, junior doctors think this is okay. They think this is normal. And so the cycle simply persists. Interprofessional intercivility is common amongst healthcare staff. A systematic review as part of a larger PhD uh, thesis by Birkbeck College in London found that 77% of doctors and 65% of nurses regularly demonstrate incivility traits towards their colleagues. Yes, three quarters of you are sinners. But what's really frightening from all the literature in healthcare interactions, what's really, really, really frightening is bias because no human being will admit to being a wanker. And the vast majority of offenders are not aware of the effects of their incivility and therefore totally oblivious to the effects of the incivility on the person or the patient. And so I have a question for you. This could backfire on me badly. <laughs> what four specialties do you believe are the most incivil or difficult to work with in medicine? And no, you can't say emergency medicine. Internal medicine. Internal medicine. Surgeons. surgeons. Is that general surgeons or you're allowed to, you're allowed to you know, branch it out here a bit? So general surgeons, yeah? Okay. Neurosurgeons, <laughs> interesting. Sorry, okay, let's, 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 let's leave the surgeons for a little bit. Any, any other two? Anesthesia. Anesthesia, okay. Go on. So Birkbeck said radiology. Does that surprise you? I actually understand that, that radiology in Sweden is pretty good. Yeah, we have, a, we have, we have problems. <laughs> General surgeons, you got it right. Neurosurgeons, obviously. <laughs> Cardiology. Oh my goodness, I'm seeing a lot of nods. Okay, so incivility is ingrained in medical culture. We are aware that we do it. Are we? No, we're not. We're unaware that we do it. Okay, so it's ingrained. We're not aware of it. But what helps to normalize such behavior? Think about it. Very, very, very few of us have formal teaching qualifications. Yet we all expected to be educators. In medical school, traditionally, since the time of Hippocrates, we learned through humiliation. We learned to make sure we stood at the end of the row so that somebody else got the answer to the questions first, yeah? All the way down the row, and my knowledge is better than yours. Go and learn it, go and learn it, go and learn it. We learn through humiliation. So what happens? We teach through humiliation because it's the only way we've learned how to teach. We then fire our young, brightest medical students into the big, bad world expecting them to work effectively, compassionately, with good quality communication, 
where they've literally spent half a decade in a culture of bullying, inappropriate questioning, and unrealistic expectations. We have to change the way we do medical school. Now, conflict of interest here. I teach at UCC, University College Cork, and who is University College Cork got extremely close medical school ties with, and which students come across all the time to us? Gothenburg. Yes. All right? So I know how you teach. It's surprising that an intern shows anything other than courtesy to a member of the nursing staff when they're sleep deprived and getting paged in the middle of the night for menial tasks. It wasn't that long ago that complex heart operations in St. George's Hospital in London got completely pulled. Cardiothoracic surgery got completely taken away from that hospital due to an above average death rate. Yes, death rate. The Care Quality Commission, which is the regulator in the UK, found a toxic culture where surgeons with strong personalities had just simply were not able to work together. Whilst there had always been tribalism in groups of cardiothoracic surgeons, cardiologists, and anaesthetists, what happened was top-down management competition. And so the fighting only really truly started when collective groups of specialists came together, so they were little pods, and they were competing against each other for theater space, access to patients, access to resources, access to, access to beds, access, access, access. People died because of that. It took a few... I mean, if we have to look towards the future, where is this healthcare raft heading? We have to understand that healthcare is sinking in its own success. And we're part of the problem. Them damn patients are living longer. Yeah? And now we have this silver tsunami of elderly patients with complex, unmet medical needs. And emergency medicine really is the piggy in the middle, isn't it? Um, we've seen a fit, we have seen a 30% increase in the over 75s presenting to our emergency department with uncared me needs this year. 30% increase in over 75s. Just think about that for a second. We see 300 patients a day in my emergency department. And now we've got a 30% increase in over 75s. Like, where do you think these patients end up going when the hospital's full? They get warehoused in the emergency department on corridors. And I challenge you to go and look at the INMO, Irish Nursing Midwifery Organization, INMO website, and look at Trolley Watch Ireland, because it will give you the live statistics. And last night I looked at it, we have 75 patients currently on our corridor in our emergency department who are already admitted by the specialists but have no hospital bed to go to. Our, our hospitals are full. And when resources become strained, our jobs, which is easy, like I think our job's really easy, it's signposting, right? It becomes challenging. It used to be really easy to refer patients up and down those different pathways, and now we get met with that because we really don't have the resource and the capacity. Our ologists don't have the resource and the capacity. And we just make matters worse, don't we? Because we're really, really, really good, aren't we? Yeah, as a group of specialists. I mean, I'll use this orthopedic Example, okay, 16-year-old rugby player, ouch, yeah? Okay, so what do we do as emergency medicine? We pat ourselves on the back, as good psychophants are. We say we've done a really, really, really good job because we provide a really safe procedural analgesia and sedation service. We go click, it goes back in. Yeah, there was no fracture on that. It was a purely ligamentous injury. Yeah, we know that, we've diagnosed that. And then what do we do? And think about it, because this is really bad. Because that's good quality care for that patient, yeah? We all agree with that. that. That's all happening, yeah? As soon as possible. Then we pick up the phone to call the orthopedic reg. Does anybody see a problem with this? We take away their mojo. We've literally taken away their tasty treats. 
And then to make matters worse, we speed off to treat the next patient, in other words, emergency medicine, leaving the ologist to pick up on the boring work. And you wonder why we get talked down to by a junior ologist for not ordering their consultant's favorite serum rhubarb or failing to put a certain dressing on or not prescribing some random drug with a 0.00001% you know, improvement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Emergency medicine folks, we are, we are part of the problem as well. Incivility, is it such a big deal? What does it affect on the provider? A good friend of mine responded to this ambulance call on their shift and uh, highly charged scene, low GCS, agitated, uh, obvious traumatic brain injury as well, teeth all knocked out, proper assault, you know. Um, going to be a really difficult airway if they were to intubate, stab wound, central chest. Now, the blood pressure was ho holding just now. So there was a conflicting picture here, you know. Was it just a head injury? Was it a heart injury? Was it, was it both? Um, and I point out that Heldon, who did it, is one of the attack medical directors, and listen, he wrote <laughs> the very scenario for the attack course, and he actually delivers the lecture on decision-making for HALO procedures. He knows what he's doing. He had ultrasound with him, as a good quality critical care resource pre-hospital does. You look for that, it wasn't there. Okay, so he made a decision, and a really good decision, I think, because his plan was scoop and run, do very little, move towards the hospital, which was 80 minutes away. And um, they were going to intubate and do a thoracotomy only if the patient arrested, which I think is fair. Yeah, so move. Loading of the patient onto the ambulance stretcher, they arrest, obviously. And so performed the resuscitative thoracotomy. And yeah, T, tamponade, found the problem, big RV wound. Difficult to close, but they did. Kept the blood products going because they carry them. Well-functioning system, able to call up for a police resource to bring blood products to them. So en route, they got more blood products. And this patient started to do really well. This patient survived. Not only did they get ROS, but they required more and more anesthetic to keep them asleep, they were showing signs of neurological recovery. This was great stuff. This team was on cloud nine. This team arrived into an emergency department which was pre-alerted, despite being the middle of the night, full of, of resuscitologists. You know, they, 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 everything was going well. They were slick, they were on top of their game. This was the best thing ever since sliced bread. This person was alive. Bang. Spotlight on them in front of them, in front of everybody, a senior emergency medicine consultant tore the team apart. They didn't even listen to the handover, just started questioning. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why would you do this? And my old favorite, in my clinical practice, I would not have. I would not have done that. That is just totally inappropriate. Ba 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 Can you see this happening? It was like a final membership exam, even worse, done in such a way that the team who thus far outperformed what you would expect against all the odds, you know, they thought they were failures. Have they done something wrong? Have you ever experienced somebody talking to you when literally you cannot get a word in edgeways? You cannot even put a word in, because to do so might even seem impolite. And every other word is I, me, 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 I. Classic narcissism. Normally, Heldon would have been more than able to manage this kind of resus wanker. But remember, the team are vulnerable. They are coming down from a ad massive adrenaline rush. And in the middle of the night, they've just dealt with tragedy. They've dealt with what they've been trained for all their lives. They've done their absolute best, under really difficult circumstances. And they were taken down at that point of the adrenaline rush. And the adrenaline rush, folks, adrenaline dump is a very real phenomenon. Successful predators, and I mean human beings here, sense and manipulate 
post-adrenaline rush vulnerability to their own gain. There are colleagues who have absolutely perfected this art of bullying. It's the same as a feigned retreat. You know, feigned retreat in military, um, in, in military tactics. The opposition stands down, right? And, and they, they run away. And then the other team goes and, or the other side goes and looks, oh my goodness, the fighting's over. Oh, thank goodness, we've won, we've won. The adrenaline drops. And then another attack happens. And that attack happens when they're vulnerable. And it's a very well-used tactic currently in warfare. And imposter syndrome is very real. Regardless how senior or junior you are, imposter syndrome, you start questioning your own practice. Doubt creeps in. Because these are the very jobs you train for. And you do them, and then your confidence is just wiped out from underneath you. Your performance is being knocked. And to make matters worse, that emergency department didn't even invite that pre-hospital team to the debrief. They didn't even provide feedback. How would you feel? Do you think that team is likely to even want to take the patient to that department in the future? No. <laughs> Do you think that pre-hospital team would voluntarily choose to interact with that person, even if it meant that a patient would suffer? It's possible. A complex lack of emotional awareness or maturity, or simply put, a narcissistic spectrum disorder, has very real effects on healthcare outcomes. And I've given you a really extreme example, okay? But what are the effects of the more subtle, everyday stuff that we're not aware of? We need to maintain and, and create open and honest dialogue about the psychological and the clinical effects of everyday rudeness. Our ability to juggle things is directly affected by rudeness. Rudeness literally eats into our bandwidth, our ability to actually take things in. It disproportionately affects emergency medicine physicians. Why? Because we have a higher percentage of ADHD in our tribe. Okay? And that is something to be celebrated. It's what makes us so damn good at what we are. And if something doesn't make sense, what does the ADHD brain do? It gnaws away at it and tries to make sense of it. Okay? And that takes away our bandwidth. 80% of us lose time worrying about rudeness if we have ADHD. 63% of people without ADHD will actively avoid that person as well. And amazingly, you can simulate this in sim rooms. Okay? Really good experiment. Okay, so the experiment was done with anesthetist initially. Now, in anesthetics, there's a 13% rate of autistic spectrum disorder in anesthetist, okay? In the UK. That's really well defined, all right? So, they were demonstrated rudeness in a simulated anesthetic surgical environment, okay? and it reduced their performance by 33%. Wow. They did the same thing to emergency medicine. How do you think it affected our performance? This is an RCT, this is a really well done study. This is mad stuff. 61% of emergency medicine physicians in a resuscitation scenario did worse when there was rudeness in the room. Wow. Royal College of Physicians did a study, and they looked at, and then this is coming back down to what I do as, as a regulator, we look at adverse incidents when healthcare has gone wrong and the poor person is sitting in front of the panel about to lose their license. 67% of adverse incidents that the Royal College of Physicians looked at, incivility or rudeness or inability to communicate effectively and courteously amongst professionals was the root cause of the problem. Wow. Obviously, work-life balance gets affected too. We reduce our commitment to work, we reduce our time at work, and the, most, the worst thing is we seek alternative employment, or at very worst, leave the profession altogether. We have to do something. Like many of you, I've experienced the effects of incivility, including overt bullying. 
I just accepted it was part of normal work in medicine and you just had to toughen up and it just was part of what you had to do. Until a recess wanker came after me, not many years ago. I was forced to tackle this problem. Massive blunt traumatic cardiac arrest, struck by a car on a high-speed motorway, blunt, right? He survived the pre-hospital resuscitative thoracotomy, that's him, in my recess bed in my hospital. What happened? <laughs> my tribe bounced for joy because two of their own had <laughs> done the improbable. Um, you know, could we possibly have a survivor from a blunt traumatic cardiac arrest? Like, what are the odds? Like, my tribe were like all over me, gushy. Like, I mean, myself and Owen were really getting it. And then came the predictable viciousness. Massive, massive anger and accusations of inappropriateness from the specialist who then would have to take on the care of this patient for the months and possibly even years ahead. There's no point really going into the why, okay, because a recess wanker will always find why. But these accusations used words like futility, unnecessary, in my practice I would not. So I did what John would do, and I, and I sought out the skeptics, and it was really hard to explain away the narcissist, because the narcissist starts ahead of you, and you're always trying to play catch-up. But good quality note-taking and video evidence from, from the time actually won our case in the end, and, and only after really serious, high-level incident management team came about and ex external experts were put into the room. And we thought, look, that was the end of it. Um, it was put to bed until remarkably after more than a year he walked down the aisle and got married and he fundraised and donated a hell of a lot of money to the emergency department charity like massive kudos all around and then you know what happened it all kicked off again because narcissists don't like to lose face okay and this incivility was awful. The hospital CEO had to actually step in and draw a line. And he literally had to draw a line into, and say, look, there's difference in opinion between two specialists. But that's it, full stop. We have to stop this because it is affecting work. If this didn't directly happen to me, I wouldn't even believe it could happen. It was so far-fetched. So what would happen if this happened to one of our junior colleagues? definitely wouldn't have had the bandwidth or the maturity or the expertise or, or, or the years of dealing with this to cope. We have to do better dialogue. Now, this is my team. This is my tribe. This, this, this is Cork Emergency Department. These, some of these people I've worked alongside for 16 years. I feel safe in this tribe. Yeah, look, there's psychophants in there who pat me on the back. There's also really, really good skeptics there who will prod me and poke me and say, Is that, was that really necessary? But in a loving way, because they want to learn, they want to keep the team going. Definitely no resource bankers there. We have to manage incivility when it happens. And that involves strong leadership, that involves all of us. Whilst our baseline might be passive and, and sometimes even submissive, and I think if you, if you look at emergency medicine, how we are so successful navigating pathways for patients is often we play the submissive or play the passive because sometimes it's easier and you, then you just go around them, right? We, there are a few nods in the audience. Um, hopefully I've made it absolutely clear to you that incivility amongst us, instability amongst medical staff is a real patient safety threat we need to see it and then move into an assertive role. Whilst our baseline is passive, it's a patient safety threat. And hopefully I've made it absolutely clear that to be aggressive is not the response. Assertive is different to aggressive. Aggressiveness is like farting in a lift, okay? You break wind in the lift, you feel better, all right? But everybody else suffers. It's simply fighting incivility with incivility. We have to learn ass assertiveness. And there are excellent graded assertive models out there. And the same way that we pace when there's somebody whose sats are dropping and somebody is so 
task focused that they're not appreciating that the patient is deteriorating. You know, we pace, you, you know these sort of acronyms? Yeah, graded assertiveness. Well, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing with, um, with somebody who's being rude. You can say, probe them, but yeah, look, you look concerned about something. Can I help? Are you aware that your comments could be misinterpreted? That, that's my alert usually. Usually when I'm saying that, that's... <laughs> I'm boiling underneath, but I'm really polite. You know, pull them aside. You could challenge them. You know, I don't think this conversation in its current form is particularly helpful. I'm still being nice, I'm still being polite. Or it's a real emergency. It's time to stop this conversation and involve a third party or a more senior. Okay? Because we don't want to end up here in conflict or dispute resolution. Um, this is not the purpose involving someone more senior. The purpose involving someone more senior is nine times out of ten, it's the decisions that senior staff and administrative staff make that have made that referral pathway awkward or difficult and have caused the boundary for that junior person to refer the patient on. And it's really up to the senior person to own it and, and, and to come up with the solutions, not the juniors. This is what makes good emergency medicine physician. To do this, we have to have a degree of neurodivergence and we have to accept it and we have to celebrate it. All right? Emergency medicine came from the Wiki Wild West. If you think back a generation, emergency departments were lawless, tribeless. There were zones of young doctors trying to find their identity. Uh, patients were at the mercy of whoever they got. And frankly, um, you know, it wasn't good. And thankfully, manners have been put on this by the likes of yourselves, by the likes of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in the UK and Ireland. Manners have been put on things by virtue of the fact that we create guidelines for what we do and pathways for what we do. This is emed, E-M-E-D dot I-E, E-M-E-D dot I-E, I-E for the island. This is our own emergency department um, algorithm. And we, we write it and keep it updated in Cork. It is massive, by the way. And it's very easy to read by dyslexics. Okay. We use these guidelines to reform pathways. We actively look at different pathways every month to ensure that we can do better and better so that we avoid conflict. So for example, orthopedics, we literally, I kid you not, right? There is a whole wall. This, 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 this thing is printed on two A0 posters all the way down in, in small print, right? And it's all of the pathways and what to do with every single orthopedic eventuality. And you know, we actually had to do that to stop conflict. And now, orthopedics and emergency medicine go partying and drinking together. It never used to happen, all right? Anonymity breeds incivility. I have completely stopped using the phone. It's pointless. Get off your phones. It takes more time to walk to radiology, for example, but now everybody's on first name basis. We have discussions. I understand their department. They understand our needs. And you know something? We've even started to see radiologists wander down to the department to give us reports where they're worried about a patient. Isn't that nice? All right? That's because we've developed the friendships. Make time to have non work related conversations. It's really difficult, all right? I don't phone the acute medic on take anymore. I walk over to, I know where they hang out, you see. And you walk over to them and you say, hey, look, this is what I've got. How are you guys doing today? Do you fancy lunch later on? Great, we'll get a cup of coffee later on. It really, really works. We started having joint national trauma meetings with orthopedics, radiology, and emergency medicine. So we we're forced to present the same patient. And that's where we start to iron out the little niggles, the tiny little things that could blow up and become bigger because we're writing a presentation together. It works. We now are in the process of developing national-wide responses for major trauma. What should we see? What should happen? When should patients get the care that they need when they come off that motorbike? Who should be providing it? How it should be provided? We train these HALO procedures now, not in isolation with our own tribe, but with theologists. 
It's amazing what you get when you start to come together and you put the evidence on the table. And then the cardiothoracic surgeon goes, but what if I'm scrubbed in a case and I'm the only doctor there? Yeah, we have to do it. Oh. And the penny drops. That actually, they physically cannot be there in time every time. They aren't able to go pre-hospital and provide the care where the patient actually drops. Above all, We've got to change culture. Incivility is contagious. You have to stop the spread. Civility has to be demonstrated from top down. We've got to speak to each other you know, in, in pleasant, friendly, professional ways at all times. Okay? And we've got to show our juniors that this is how adult, mature humans behave. If you don't believe me, ask Google. And Google spent billions Billions researching incivility in their workplace. And you know what they came up with? You know what their conclusion after spending 2.2 billion was? Be kind. That's it. Easier said than done. It's not impossible, though, to convince bullies and thugs that they need to be kind. You have to appeal to the narcissist. Narcissistic personality disorders involve a pattern of self-centered, arrogant thinking and behavior with a complete lack of empathy and consideration for other people. You cannot tell a narcissist to be kind. They do not understand. They just cannot do it. All right? So think about it. You need narcissists. You need narcissists that were suited to high-performance professional contact sports, such as orthopedic surgery. Right? The New Zealand rugby team believes the core to success is redefining themselves culturally. They've woken up to the realization that incivility directly hinders performance. So they have a strict, and it's called this, by the way, they have a strict no asshole policy. It reduces rudeness and incivility. For example, they are not allowed to play pranks on each other. It just does not happen. Because when it's about I, it's not about the team. And embedded in rugby culture, right from the juniors, the little e's, this culture continues. And this is why New Zealand is one of the most successful rugby nations in the world, only secondary to South Africa and Ireland. Emergency medicine are universally accessible. Care is never refused. There's something that we all need to be proud of and promote. We continue to outperform ourselves year in, year out. We see 1.4 million patients a year in Ireland emergency departments, and we discharge and treat the care on 1.05 million every single year. That's it, guys. Emergency medicine isn't a problem. We are the success. We, tr we treat and discharge 76% of all hospital attendances. And we do so with pathways. Our jobs are dynamic. We signpost people. But above all, if you want flow, if you want happiness, if you want workplace, you want to be at the top of your game, you've got to be civil to each other. Flow. The unmistakable feeling of unstoppable of no problem that can't be solved, of no one else can do it better, that whatever the day throws at you, you simply take it in your stride. Because you've found your rhythm. We're good, we're good, we're good. This is Perdia, he's six weeks old. Period of um, bradycardia, CPR for about one cycle, literally just a minute, picked him up again. Be proud of who you are, but be civil all the time. Thank you.